Uh, you good? Everything straight? Yeah. Good. Well, we're about to get started. Uh, I'm Jonathan Wiseman. This is podcastmarketing.com. Today is another episode of The Grit. And what The Grit is, is simply a podcast where we want to bring in aspiring entrepreneurs, existing entrepreneurs that have been doing this for 30 years. We want to bring business owners in here, hear their stories, the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, most people that are in entrepreneurship or have ran businesses, um, you know, people on the outside look in and they're like, oh, you know, overnight success, they made it, they're rich, they're doing great, you know, oh, it was so easy, I want to be like them. And nobody really understands the shit that everybody goes through to get there or how many failures there were along the way. So what we want to do is one, of course, highlight local entrepreneurs and local businesses, and two, just to hear people's story. You know, what was your story? What business were you in? What were your ups and your downs, your aha moments, the oh shit moments, all of that. The journey. Yeah, absolutely. Because we want to let other aspiring entrepreneurs hear these stories so that they can relate to them. And so we're bringing in different people like yourself and interviewing them and bringing them in here and just chopping it up, talking shop. And hopefully it lends itself to help others. Yeah, I'm excited to be here just so for that reason. Yeah. Let's go ahead and introduce yourself. Let's tell us what your name is. OK, so my name is Jasmine Perla. Hi, and Jasmine. Hi. <laughs> what business are you in? What's your company? So I am a photographer. OK, cool. What kind yeah. of photography? Uh, so I do food photography, portrait photography. Um, I spent 10 years in the food business um, prior to taking... What business was it? The food industry business. I was doing... Um, most recently, I did a couple of years of restaurant management. Okay, cool. Yeah, so for Papacitos, uh, Red River Cantina. So uh, yeah, so I did that. And then I morphed into the food photographer for the last restaurant that I was working for as a manager. And that's kind of where I just took it Found and ran yeah. yeah so you love it so were you in for, were you into photography before this so actually my story of how i fell in love with photography i uh was working as a restaurant manager for papacitos and love um, papacitos by the way it's too good like dangerously good it's amazing um but so i was working there as a restaurant management love the company love the food obviously it's a fantastic company to work for one of my favorites that i've had that i have worked for um, however, restaurant management was just not for me. So, sure. um, I get it. I owned different, I was in the nightlife industry and hospitality owned bars, nightclubs. Some of those had restaurants, it just drains sports you. bars. It's draining. I mean, for me, it was, there are some people that obviously that's their passion and that's what they live for. It was my passion when I was 19, 20, 22. Right. <laughs> and then things changed. And grew right? out of it. Of right. course. Sure. But so, I get the business. Absolutely. Long hours, long hours, a lot of babysitting. Yeah. You have to, you have to love it. To yeah, you do. It. Well, and that's one thing in business that uh, is good for aspiring entrepreneurs to know is when you're in a hospitality business, you know, it's one thing to have a staff and manage a staff. And sometimes that means babysitting. Uh, but it's a whole additional process when you have customers and a lot right. of customers whether it's a, you know, shit, a bar, nightclub, restaurant, I'm just thinking some of the ones I was in, you have to babysit a lot of those patrons as well or manage them. Oh, absolutely. So it's like even more so double the work. Right. Um, so I did that for a little over a year, despite how little I felt fulfilled and how little happiness it was bringing me. Um, and at that point I was working so many hours, you could probably relate. I was working so many hours that I didn't have time to spend the money. Sure. So it was just accumulating. There you and, go. Um, That's a good problem. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> so at the end of about 15 months or so, I was so unhappy and I had always had this dream of taking off on a one-way ticket. So I did it. I bought a one-way ticket to South America. Sweet. Um, I was out there for almost a year. Wow. And that's kind of where I fell in love with photography. So that's I amazing. bought just a very small Sony a 5100 mirrorless camera and um, I took off with it 
And that camera for me just became such an amazing outlet. And I just fell in love with taking pictures of everything and anything like landscapes. I did a lot of hiking. The main objective of my trip was kind of like a self-discovery journey. And the way that I do that is through community outreach and giving back. So I did a lot of that while I was in South America. Um, and yeah, in the process, you know, took pictures of all of my adventures and all of my journeys and things. And so that's how I fell in love with photography. It was mostly started off as landscape and, um, it just developed from there. So yeah, it was a beautiful experience to be there. And obviously I was surrounded by so much inspiring absolutely backdrops and people that I was meeting. And, um, it was such a wonderful experience experience that really brought out I feel like the creativity in me so so where all did you travel to what was your first destination my first destination is actually my very first love and it's Colombia and yeah. it's still to this day my favorite country um, what part did you go to first I landed in Cartagena okay and I spent a month there wow. working with children that were in rehab for drugs and alcohol okay and uh, that was I believe, yeah, I was there for a month and it was really impactful. It was wonderful. Yeah. So Cartagena is very... One of my best friends is from Colombia. It's a beautiful place, man. And even better, like landscape wise, it's gorgeous. Yeah. But the people, like the culture is just so amazing. And that's really what I fell in love with. Really cool. So you were there for a month. I was working with uh, those children for a month. I was actually in Colombia for three months. Okay. Yeah. And so you're working with children. How do you connect with the different outreach programs? Was that something here from the States or did you just get there and start doing the research to figure it out? So a lot of people from the outside looking in might think like, oh, she just bought a one way ticket and went and figured it out as she went. But it actually took kind of like how you were saying earlier, how some people see like the overnight success, but it was a lot of research. And so I really, really dug in for probably about six months doing all of this research. And it was a company that I found on the internet um, that was uh, really well known and had sent a lot of volunteers internationally to do uh, work like that. Okay, real cool. Yeah. It can get scary taking a one way ticket out of the country, you know, so it's uh it's like my daughter, you know, she's older and it's like, Look, why don't you go backpacking for a year? Just Yeah. Oh, fly fly I, to Europe and jump on a bunch of trains. I recommend it for everyone. Yeah. But doing Absolutely. the research is it's not just it's jumping on a plane and going without researching it. Right, you need right. To, and especially oh god. Like the looks on people's faces when I would tell them like, I'm going to Colombia on a solo journey all by myself. Yeah, one way ticket. For three months on a one way ticket. You know, like. So three months, you just said three months. Did three months turn into a year? Three months turned into about 10 or 11 months. Yeah. Basically a year. Right. Close enough. So about a year. Where'd you travel to after? After that, I did uh, Peru. Sweet. Which was phenomenal. And uh, I did Ecuador as well. Okay. My uh, my mom's side of the family is actually from Ecuador. Okay. So I did have some family there, which was a nice little break from having to stay in like hostels and having to like, you know, sure. kind of be on my own. So I did spend about a month with my grandmother in Ecuador. And so that was really awesome. Oh, that's really cool. And yeah. I'm assuming you speak the language. I do. I'm fluent. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So that also helped. <laughs> that that yeah. could have been, <laughs> you could have gotten a lot of trouble if you didn't. You would be really surprised though. Um, I spent a lot of my time with other English native English speakers because although it's not a very big culture here in the States in Europe it's a very big culture that after high school you take a year you go and you explore so a lot of these hostels and a lot of these hotels and things that I was staying in I was surrounded mostly by English speakers that's awesome so it it made it fairly easy um, for me, because I do speak the language, but even for someone that doesn't speak the language, I think that it would, it would be it's a It's pretty user friendly. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, most places are Americanized. That are yeah, close. exactly. So yeah. it is what it is. Well, let's talk about how you took that passion and, and given back, which is amazing and, and bringing it back to the States a year later to right. turn it into a business. Did, did you realize why you were there? When I go back, I want to turn this into a business? Or? Absolutely not. I did not know what I was going to so do. So how did that transition? So I'm assuming after you go vacation for a year uh, and travel and do some sightseeing, the intention originally wasn't, you know, 
let me turn this into a business. It was not at all. Let, yeah. me, just, let me just go backpacking through South yeah. America and have some the, fun. The intention was to go and for one, give back and for two kind of, um, discover yourself, discover myself. Sure. Right. And so when I came back, it was actually really difficult for me because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I felt in some ways, even a little bit more lost than when I left. Sure. Um, but that's scary. It, yeah, it was scary. And I got extremely depressed. Yeah. I can imagine months. the last month being there, not knowing what you were coming home to. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I got extremely depressed when I came back. Um, how old were you during this time? I was 25 when I took off. Okay. Yeah. And I, I celebrated my 26th birthday when I came back in Real December. Cool. Yeah. At the end of that year. Um, but it was, it was really hard. And so actually what ended up happening is I ran into, uh, the gentleman that hired me on to Papacitos for the very first time, the day that I got back from a cruise. Yeah. And just coincidental and nothing is coincidence. Right. So like everything happens for a reason. And I truly believe that, um, at that moment I didn't know what was happening, Sure. but all I knew was that I didn't have a job. I didn't have anything lined up. And, uh, I ran into him at a workout that I didn't even plan on going to until the last five seconds that I took off in my car and went. So, um, ran into him and he offered me another restaurant management job and I justified myself and I said, Hey, like maybe I just didn't like the last location that I was at. I was managing the Papacitas across from NRG, which is a very crazy location. Sure. And so I gave it another shot. Um, I worked that for six months and I still didn't like it. And I was still unhappy, not because of the restaurant or because of the people, but because of the position that just was not for me. So I worked that for six months. Um, And what position was it? It was a restaurant management. Okay. I was again back in the same position that I found myself in before I left in which I was unhappy. And were you managing the floor? I was the managing restaurant? the floor. Okay. Yeah. I, was I know there's the floor. bar, floor, right. kitchen. So right. managing the floor and the, the, the waitresses and waiters. Yeah. Okay. So um, I put my two weeks in there and on my way out, I had already started shooting some couples. I had started shooting nothing paid for. It was like more like, let me reach out to my friends and see if I can get some practice behind the camera. Sure. Um, And so on my way out, I asked him, Hey, would you mind me taking over your social media account? I want, I want access to that. And I want to see what I can do for you there because they didn't have really a social media presence. Um, and I told him like, I'll take all of your photographs. I'll edit everything. I'll copyright everything. I'll do all of the work. I just want my hands on it. And, um, he was reluctant at first because he already had somebody that was working on it. But, uh, he did end up letting me take over that, over that platform and, um, went so much better than I could have expected. That's amazing. So that was kind of my, and did you do that with photo first? Did you use the photography to help build that presence? Yes. So I went and I would do regular photo shoots for them. And I think a lot of what especially in my category, a lot of people don't like the idea of doing free work. Sure. But when you are first starting out, yeah, that's you have to know. Nobody that likes doing anything for free. <laughs> if you Absolutely. don't have, if you don't have a portfolio, if you don't have experience, if you don't have anything to say, like to prove that you know what you're doing, you might have to do some work for free. And so that's what I did for about a month or two. I built my portfolio. I did all of their photo shoots. I did, um, all of the professional editing for their photos. I wrote all of their, I styled all of their, um, social Beeps. media content. I posted everything. I engaged on everything. I reached out to influencers. I did the whole thing. Um, and you did this all at no cost to, I did it all at no cost to prove yourself, to show right. your worth in hopes to get the business. Right. Well, it's, you know, I completely get it. The, the video I just showed you before we started, that was on my dime, right? The photography was on my dime. The video was on my dime. All of it's on my dime to show a potential client. Look, this is what I can do for you. If you like my product, then hire me. Or if you like my services, 
and uh, another example is I have a client who is starting a directory where they sell stuff online, similar to that of a eBay. And you know, if you don't have any listings on there already, you're brand new, you're fresh. It's like, how are you going to reach out to people, telling them to come list on your website when nobody's there? Or how are you really going to get them to pay to list when you have no traffic? Right. So it's like, make it free for six months. Let everybody list for free. You even go grab their listings from other sites and throw it on there. You have to do free when you're brand new sometimes. I think that people are afraid of free, but the mentality can't be about just right now. Because if you're in it for the long run, right? And I think that's a great point. Right. And Absolutely. you're doing it for free. It's an investment. But eventually that work is going to speak for itself if and that good. work, <laughs> right. If you're good. If and you're that's good. where some people that might doubt their own ability might say, well, Oh, I don't know if I can do that, but you're never going to get better if you don't do it anyways. You got to try to know. Exactly. So maybe you suck at it, but you know, like <laughs> at least you say you gave it a shot. Yeah, right. absolutely. So you and worked there for a couple months. You got their social media up and running. I got it up and running. It was super successful. Um, the page still, like, you know, it looks great. It's very, very eye appealing. Uh, the, ph the photographs are wonderful. They use it for, you know, their print marketing and things now as well. So at what point did it go from free to where you had the audacity to say, okay, I know my worth. This is great shit. I'm right. blowing you up. Right now, I want to get a paycheck. Will you hire me? How did that conversation go? So, um, at first, obviously they were very reluctant. Um, and I was very very honest with them because I think honesty is obviously the best policy. And so I said, well, if you guys don't have it in your budget to offer me any kind of compensation, then I'm going to take this portfolio. And they knew from the very beginning that that was my goal was to build that portfolio. I'm going to take this portfolio that I've built for you guys and I'm going to go market myself to people that uh, may potentially want to invest in this service. Sure. And so, um, so that's exactly what I did. And Good. <laughs> Good I for took you. my portfolio and I've always been a very like in-person kind of person. I don't prefer to send emails. I don't prefer to send DMs. I don't prefer to send, make phone calls. I live in Pearland and I went personally to a handful of restaurants and just asked to talk to the manager, talk to their GM, talk to them about my services, talk to them about what I can offer them. And so I was politely knocking down the door to these establishments that I would do my research. I would look through their Instagram posts and see if they were not reaching the potential that I knew that I could get them to. And uh, I would go directly to them. I think that's great. It's market research. Yeah. That is uh, a, a great way, you know, not necessarily for entrepreneurs only, but for just people looking for jobs. I think that a lot of people, especially photographers, videographers, creative people, we think that because we have a portfolio or because we have a website or because we have a platform, um, that people are just going to find you. No. Like people are just going to book you. And people are afraid to go out and get it and go out and make it happen. And sometimes you have to do that. If you want things to happen, you have to go for it. You can't just wait around for people to come and, and find you. That's not how it works. Always. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Now, and one thing I've learned is, you know, left brain, right brain, if you will. A lot of people on the creative side want to remain creative and stay in their little bubble. Yes. And it's very scary to step outside that bubble. And yeah. it's like a yin and yang. Sometimes they need a counterpart to make that happen. And that's why I think, you know, certain individuals are, you know, stuck to working for somebody and they're comfortable with that. That, you know, it's again, it's how does your brain function? How do you think? How do you work? Entrepreneurship's not for everybody. And you've got the creative side, but you've also got the grit to get the fuck out of the house and go hit the pavement and do what you need to do to start building your business, your resume, your portfolio. Right. I think it's just a lot about um, perspective because those things are not there. There are things that I know that I need to do, but they're not necessarily things that are easy for me. Sure. Absolutely. So it, I think it's like feeling that fear 
Well, none uh, of it's and easy. And still doing it anyways. Yeah, because yeah. if it was easy, everybody would do it. Of course, yeah. And uh, <laughs> how are of you going to stand out in the crowd? <laughs> and, and I think it's safe to say, and it's okay for the ones that don't have that entrepreneurship mentality, it's okay to just be an artist or a photographer oh, or a videographer and to work for somebody and go find a job and, and be happy in that position. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's just you know, different walks of life and some people want more and you were one of the ones that wanted a little bit more and to do it for yourself. Right. And it just depends on like what that more is for you. Right. So I was actually thinking about some of the sacrifices that I've had to make in order to tell me be about those. able to do what I'm doing. And I think one of the biggest sacrifices that you just hit on that I totally agree with is I've had to sacrifice security. Absolutely, job security. Yeah, of like knowing that, hey, every two weeks that paycheck is gonna come in because I show up eight to 12 hours a day and work. Doesn't mean work. you're gonna get paid, yeah. Right, and I've worked so many days where I haven't seen a single penny. And that's, that's a big sacrifice, yeah. is not having the security of like, you could work for two weeks straight and that doesn't mean you're going to get a paycheck on Friday. So yeah. it's that that security is a huge sacrifice. That think. is one of the scariest things yeah. of being in business for yourself is no guaranteed income. But it also really pushes you because you know that you you have to work harder than the average person. And even though it might not pay off right now, like that whole month or two or whatever, however long it was that I did that work for free, I worked my butt off and it was... Yeah, it was stressful and it was it was um, more fulfilling for me because I enjoyed the process, but it was still difficult and I didn't see a penny. But now, months later, I'm seeing a return because I now have another client. I'm booking photo shoots. So it, it does feel quite like a huge sacrifice to say, like, I'm going to work and not see pay now. But you have to, like I said earlier, like have a bigger perspective and if you're going to be an entrepreneur you have to be in it for the long run because if you're in it for the short term you're gonna hit a brick wall exactly no, and it. then people give up you know that's when people just throw the towel in and they're like it's been a year I'm not as successful as I thought I'd be you know like how long did it take yeah so and, and speaking to that fact how long did it take because you started with Papacitos you went and played the field to kind of right. figure it out did you end up staying with Papacitos and stick it out or did you find somewhere else to no to? so I when I came back from my trip I ended up finding another restaurant well okay. the restaurant really found me so okay. yeah really so, cool. uh but I really like I said I was there for about six months so at what point did you finally kind of have that aha moment where it was like all right this is gonna work you know because it, it, it's scary as shit in the beginning phases you don't know if it's gonna work or not you know i don't care what anybody says there's doubt you're scared shitless you don't know how you're gonna feed yourself the next month or pay the bills and you put in everything that you got you grind your ass off how long did you do that until you were finally in a position where you basically said all right this is going to work for me. I don't think I ever doubted that something could work because I, I genuinely believe that if someone wants something bad enough and they work for it, um, that they can have it. I love that. But I think it was more of a mentality of like, this has to work for me because there's no other option. There's no, you can't have, a plan B because it distracts from plan A kind of thing. Now, I do think that when you put yourself in that mentality, um, you have to start, it, it pushes you to start making those sacrifices that maybe before you weren't ready to make. So when you say like, this has to work for me, like there's no other option, like I have to find a way, um, you, just, you just find the inspiration and in knowing that like, this can actually happen and also i have to make this happen because a this is my passion and b other people have found success in this and if if anyone else can do it then i can do it sure yeah, yeah if you know your product's decent right you and don't even have to if, be amazing you right. just got to be decent exactly if you put the work in you're going to be fine and i look at pictures that i've taken like a year 
if from now and I'm like, oh my God, I thought that was such a good picture. <laughs> like, even if you suck at the beginning or even if you're mediocre in the beginning, you know, like the more you do it, the better you get at it. And so there's no way around just getting in there and doing it. Sure. So yeah. I got to ask a question because I've fallen victim of this where I've taken a passion or hobby and turned it into a business. Have you found that that has taken away some of the passion since you've taken what you loved and turned it into a business? Has it diminished that passion at all or as much as you love being a photographer, has it taken from that at all for you? I think that there are moments, very brief moments, where I feel the weight of the pressure to make it work. But when I'm out on shoot or when I deliver those final edits to my clients and I see how excited and how happy they are with the results, um, there's just nothing like it. So there are some moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, like I've been staring at a computer screen for 10 hours, like, and I have to do this because this is now like my baby, my project, this is my small business where I'm just like, wow, I'm exhausted. Yeah. But it's never it's never like a, I don't want to do this anymore. And I think that's, I think that's where it becomes really important that you pursue something that you are passionate about, because if you're doing something just for the money, I think that's where you start to feel really wore out. You start to feel really like, um, you don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. It's not a passion. It's a job. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Well, and I think that's, what's great about being on the creative side or in a creative business is, everything that you're doing and providing, you're building something. You're taking something from nothing, building it and handing it over to your yeah. clients. And every time you do that, it's a new project. It's never the same thing. It's not repetitive. Right. A uh, quick example is I, I started a gun business three, four years ago. Love guns. I kind of did it as a side hustle. It was a passion of mine and might as well turn it into a business. And, you know, quickly within, and it grew quick. It did great. But within the first year, it was a, it became a job. Mm. And by year two, it was like, all right, this fucking sucks. And I haven't been to the gun range in over a year and I don't want to go see another gun. And that's where I think that it's super important to still take the time and allocate it to continue to feed yourself because you can't pour from an empty cup. So for me, Like, yeah, I go out and I shoot and I do all these things, but I also do photo shoots that aren't paid and that aren't for your self enjoyment. You know what I mean? Like I take my camera out with me and I'll just like shoot just for fun. Like I'll do projects just for fun where I I don't feel the pressure. And so I think that's super important to like go to the gun range. I'm also a certified yoga instructor. Like if I don't want to back when I was teaching a lot, if I don't want to burn myself out teaching, I also have to have my own personal practice. Like I still have to make it my own in some way and find fulfillment in that thing that used to bring me a lot of fulfillment in order to continue to do it without feeling like an overwhelming sense of pressure. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, if, if it is a passion, you need to keep it a passion. And I think that's where I lost sight of it. I turned it into a business model for mm-hmm. profit, mm-hmm. enjoyed it at the beginning phases, got burnt out, sold it, and I'm happy to be done with it. Yeah. That's and great. now I don't enjoy firearm. I mean, I have them, but right. I don't go to the gun range like right. I used to. But everything is still a stepping stone because without that, you couldn't be here. Because, Absolutely. So, so even if, and this is totally okay. And I think this is where a lot of entrepreneurs might think that they have have failed in certain aspects, um, you become so many different versions of yourself throughout your life. And if you start a passion project and it becomes a business, and then a few years later, you're like, "Eh, I don't really want to do this anymore. This isn't really a thing for me. Like, that's totally fine. Like, it might lead you to your next passion project, which is why you're here interviewing me. So it's like you move from one thing to the next and that's okay. Like, I think that entrepreneurs are really stuck to the idea of like, they start a business. They're married to it forever. Forever. Yeah. And it's like, that's all learning curve. You become so many different people. Like that might not be your thing in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you know? So, um, sure. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, to be honest. I don't either. I mean, it was yeah. a side project. It was fun. <laughs> Enjoyed it. Why, yeah. you know, there was definitely some benefits to it and, and still, uh, taking on some benefits from that. But it's, um, 
I, I can understand how, you know, something can start off as a passion definitely, and then quickly turn into a job that you just, you're not happy about. And then you do it because you have to. And now, that's, I will say while I was traveling, I did start a travel blogging uh, website and Instagram page. And that did start to be, feel like a job. And I did just stop. I think that's another great example. I stopped. You just, yeah, quit. I just quit. You have to give yourself permission to quit and not feel guilty and not feel like, for me, it was like, I felt like I was letting my followers down because I knew I would get messages. I mean, like an pouring in of messages of like, wow, like all of this is so eye opening. Like your messages are so strong, like blah, blah, blah. I felt guilty. And I felt really, really heavily that um, I shouldn't step away. But at the end of the day, it's all about you, your mental health, what you need, what you want in your life. And so that has to take precedence over sure. everything else. I get it. Yeah. Well, let's fast forward a little bit. Let's talk about now as a, you know, you, you've, you grinded your way to get to where you could turn it into a successful business or for profit, uh, took, in a, took a passion and hobby and turned it into a business model. Now, fast forward a couple years, are you working for one specific company that you work under as a contractor or do you do photography for multiple people, businesses, individuals? What is, who's your target audience? Who are your customers right now? So I do work for several different businesses. Okay. Yes. So. And you are more B2B where you do business for other businesses instead right. of the actual consumers. Yes. Um, so I really have a heart for small businesses because obviously I I'm a too. small business owner. I get it. Sure. So when I go out and I market myself to these restaurants or I market myself to um, uh, people that I want to do portraits for, it's, you know, it's like athletes or maybe personal trainers. And for restaurants, it's smaller restaurants. The restaurant that I started for was a smaller restaurant. Okay. So you stay in that realm yeah. of restaurants or portraits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So cool. I want to know a little bit about how you market yourself. Okay. You know, because for other photographers that are out there that are, you know, it's, like you said, it's a passion. It's a hobby. I right. go out, take pictures. I love doing it. Right. How do you drum up business? What is your way to generate business? Do you, how do you market yourself? So. Is it, you mentioned door knocking earlier. Yeah. You know, is that still what you do? Do you see that as the best um, result? I haven't done it as of late, but I think that the, the best form of marketing is doing really good work. <laughs> Yeah, because sure. then people will recommend you to other people. So most of the things that I've booked have been uh, through referrals. And um, I do a little bit of marketing on Instagram. I do a little bit of marketing. I do have a Facebook page. Um, but most of my marketing is referrals. And most of the books, the things that I've booked have been you know, going down to the restaurants and walking in and having a conversation. Okay. So, so it's, it's knocking on doors, right? Old school guerrilla marketing. Right. And, and that's, it works. It does work. And I have to say, um, just for like the millennials, we become so obsessed with like Instagram and social media. And it's so important to be on those platforms. It's super important, but just because you have a lot of followers or just because you have a an audience or whatever doesn't mean you're booking shoots. Yeah. I just did a video. Face to face marketing is still very alive. It's huge. Absolutely. And so you can't put all of your eggs in one basket and then wonder why you're not getting booked. You have to diversify your marketing strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the PNL side of things. Um, you know, I would, uh, what type of overhead is involved with your day to day operations? If you look at it on a monthly basis, I mean, it seems like, you're offering a service. Once you purchase the equipment, most things should be digital. Therefore, I would think your profit margins are through the roof. So with that being said, um, we do need obviously, and you guys are very familiar with like professional editing software. I do pay um, just monthly fees for like sure. websites, <laughs> editing software. Um, I have several websites so that, um, you know, I need SD cards. I need more lenses. I need cleaning kits for all of my things I need. And there's never like, a, uh, there's always new electronics, right? So like I want, um, a drone for something, you know, like there's just always like new lenses or new this or new that. But, um, as far as profit goes, at least for the first year, um, 
that I owned a camera and for the first couple of months that I was doing photo shoots, I was taking that money and reinvesting it, sure. buying new lenses, you know, like doing, upgrading the upgrading equipment, the equipment Absolutely. because that's how you get better product. So, um, yeah, so I, I do see, and also, especially for photographers and videographers, creatives, um, at the very beginning, you know, you're not going to be charging outrageous amounts of money. Sure. So yeah, you got to get good at your skills. Exactly. The more you do it, the more you will profit. But at the very beginning for me right now, all of my profit has gone directly back into, back into the business, buying more things for my business. Nah, I get it. That makes yeah. sense. Well, tell me before we get out of here, where can people find you if they need a photographer? So people can find me, um, on Instagram as Jasmine Perla dot photos on Facebook as Jasmine Perla photography. Um, and via email at jasmine.perla at yahoo.com. Real cool. Well, I'll be sure we put all that information in the description for everybody. If you need a portrait photographer or a foodie photographer, uh, here's your person right here. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. It's been Thank absolutely so amazing, and hopefully you'll come back and see us soon. Definitely. Sounds yeah. good. Thanks. Appreciate y'all tuning in. This is The Grit, highlighting Houston entrepreneurs. Jasmine Perla here in the house today. <laughs> appreciate you coming out. We'll see you on the next one, guys. Take care.